Hi everybody, welcome to our next topic in 12U Physics. Um, so today we're going to be building on our ideas that we covered last time. Uh, so last time we talked about uh, momentum and more specifically linear momentum. And so today we want to kind of build on those ideas, but we want to talk about uh, this idea of conservation of momentum. So before we get too far, just a quick refresher. Uh, momentum is given by uh, this expression here, um, and impulse is given by this expression here, but the nice thing is they link together in this pretty simple looking expression right here. So we say the force applied to an object times the time is equal to the change in that object's momentum. So let's use that idea to see if we can come up with something a little more useful than just calculating this idea of momentum. So let's start with something we're really comfortable with, so Newton's laws. And we'll start with Newton's third law. Um, and so one way to write Newton's third law is like this. So the force on objects, or sorry, the force from object one on object two is equal to the negative of the force uh, from two onto object one. And all that means is if you push something or, or a force is applied on one object, the other object applies the same magnitude force, but the opposite direction uh, to the other objects. Um, and so what we can actually do then is use that uh, with this idea that F delta T equals delta P. Um, the time interval is going to be the same for both of these. And the only difference will be that the force is in opposite directions. And what we can conclude from that is this pretty looking expression right here, that the change momentum of object one is just the same as the negative change in the momentum of object two. Um, again, another way to say that is that any momentum that object one gains, momentum two must lose. Uh, or if we say that, another way to write this is that delta momentum one plus delta momentum two has to be equal to zero. So what that means is uh, the total momentum of these two objects is a constant. And that's something pretty neat. Again, when you find something in the universe that's a constant that doesn't change, um, that's, pretty, that's pretty impressive, pretty powerful. But notice we've only considered this for two objects. Um, but I hopefully you can, uh, you can see that we can actually apply this to as many objects as we wanted to. And we can say then that for any closed system, um, to total momentum is a constant. So no matter how many particles I have, no matter how many objects I have, um, if they're the only ones that I'm considering and they're in a closed system, um, the total momentum, if I add up all the momentums for each single particle or object, um, the total would always be the same value. It would never change. Um, the only thing we have to worry about is this idea of a closed system. Um, this comes up quite a bit. Uh, it looks like at first glance a lot of uh, our everyday experiences violate this conservation of momentum, but if we're looking at a closed system, this is true regardless of the forces or the time frames involved. And this is something pretty powerful again. Um, so if I know the momentum, let's say, in the universe today, that would be the same as the momentum in the universe tomorrow, uh, a week from now, or four billion years in the past. Momentum is conserved. Uh, and so that's something, again, pretty powerful. We found out that something doesn't change. Um, so I don't think I can stress this too much, that Total momentum is a constant in any closed system. So as long as we not have outside influences, no outside forces, total momentum is a constant for that system. Uh, and again, this looks familiar. We did this sort of idea. We did conservation of energy in grade 11, um, or just reviewed right now, uh, a couple of days ago, um, that as long as I have a closed system, the total energy is, is, is conserved. All that means is no energy flows in or out. And here we're saying no forces come in or out uh, into the system, and then momentum is conserved. All right, so let's see uh, what we can do with this. So here's something uh, you might have noticed, maybe a similar situation. Um, people on ice, and so let's look at something a little unfamiliar right now. But we have a person who has a mass of 100 kilograms, and they're sitting on frictionless ice holding a 10 kilogram ball. And what we're going to have this person do, this person throws the ball at 10 meters per second east. So they're, that's a pretty strong person, actually. They're, they're throwing a 10 kilogram ball at 10 meters a second. But we want to know what happens to this person. Um, so hopefully what you can see is then just from Newton's laws that if they're applying a force east on the ball, the ball is going to have to apply a force west on the person. But let's see if we can use momentum to verify that and even get some sort of speeds here. So what we're going to start with again is that the momentum before has to be equal to the total momentum afterwards. And just like we did with energy, I'm going to denote that with uh, a prime for after. And before and after in this case are going to be before they throw the ball and after they throw the ball. 
So what had momentum, or where is this momentum stored? Well, it's actually going to be in the person and on the ball. So what I can say is that the momentum of the person plus the momentum of the ball before has to be equal to the momentum of the person after plus the momentum of the ball after. Um, but the nice thing here is that both of these to begin with are not moving, so I can say they're both zero since the, uh, the ball and the person aren't moving to begin with, they're just sitting there on the frictionless ice. Um, so what we can say then is that the momentum of the person after the throw is just equal to the negative momentum of the ball after the throw. So uh, it's the same momentum, just in opposite directions here. So let's then write this as the mass of the person times the speed, or sorry, the velocity of the person afterwards is equal to the mass of the ball times the velocity of the ball afterwards. Um, notice I don't have to worry about the mass is changing. Let's just say the person doesn't lose mass. Um, but we will look at situations later on, like rocket motion, where the mass does change. And so we have to be a little more general with our um, momentum expression. But uh, with this in mind, we have the mass of the person, we have the mass of the ball, and we know the velocity of the ball afterwards. Oh, I just realized I missed something. Hopefully you've got it again before me. I missed a minus sign here. So let me rearrange this and say the velocity of the person then after is just equal to the mass of the ball divided by the mass of the person times the velocity of the ball. Again, notice our units will work out. Uh, and again, I'll leave the calculations to you. And again, I forgot that minus sign. There it is. Um, but what I'm getting for my velocity of the person afterwards is one meter per second. And they're going to be going the opposite direction. Uh, and so they're going to be going west because of the negative sign that I keep forgetting. So this person's moving west at one meter a second after they throw the ball. And again, this is something that I imagine you notice that if you're standing on ice or something really smooth and you throw something or push something one way, you move the other. And notice that the lighter object, the ball, is traveling much faster than the heavier person um, who's moving much slower. But the product for both of these will be the same. Because the person beforehand, is, or sorry, the ball uh, afterwards is 10 meters per second at 10 kilograms, so 100 um, kilograms meters per second. And the person is going to have the exact same magnitude, 100 kilogram meters per second. But it will be negative because it's going in the direction opposite from the ball. Okay, hopefully you can follow that with me. Uh, and I have a follow-up question for you. So again, I, if uh, you need to, I'm going to ask you to pause the video here for a second and think about this question. But uh, what would we have to change about this situation if the ice were not frictionless? So think about that for a second and pause the video. And when you come back, we'll, we'll look at uh, what I thought about that situation. All right, so hopefully you followed my instructions and you paused the video. So uh, you have some idea about what you think might happen uh, and the physics behind it. But really, it's, it's uh, that we're not considering a large enough system. So if you think about friction, and again, if you imagine standing in a room throwing a ball, you don't go flying backwards. Um, but that's because our system isn't large enough. We're not considering the whole system. If we're on friction-free ice, there's no forces coming in. So our momentum isn't being added or removed from the person ball system. But if we have friction, then the Earth is applying forces. So we have to include the Earth as a whole. And this is a lot of the time when it looks like momentum conservation is broken. It's because we're not considering a large enough system. And so this is what, what's going on for this one. All right, so let's look at another example here. Uh, we have some cars, and unfortunately, they're not paying attention properly, um, and they're going to hit each other. And uh, I want to know, what is their final velocity, assuming they stick together? So these cars are so mangled together um, that they're now one unit. Uh, here is the initial velocities and the masses of these cars, and I want to know what's going on. So we're going to start with the same thing as we did before, and say the total momentum before this collision is equal to the total momentum after the collision. And what form is this momentum in? Well, we've got some in car A, and we've got some in car B. And afterwards, we have some in car A, and some in car B. And we say, OK, well, what are we looking for? We're looking for the final velocity of AB. Notice, because they're stuck together, what I can do then is I can write this, instead of momentum of A and B, I'm going to write it as momentum AB, because it's now one unit that's stuck together. And I guess I should have prime there. So this is our now expression. So we're going to say that the momentum of A and B before the collision is equal to the momentum of AB 
after the collision. So if we kind of follow this idea through, do a little bit of rearranging here, we end up with that um, the mass of A plus the mass of B times the speed of, or velocity of AB afterwards, again, that's that um, expression I had in red up there, is going to be equal to the momentum of A, oops, sorry, the mass of A times the velocity of A plus the mass of B, the velocity of B, so just writing those expressions in terms of uh, mass and velocity, and again, I'm trying to solve for this, so I just rearrange it to this form here. So the momentum that was contained in the cars before is still there, it's just in, uh, now we've combined those two together, and we end up with, again, I'll, I'll trust you to do some calculations, but I'm getting a speed, or pardon me, a velocity of 5.2 meters per second west. So these cars are now traveling west as opposed to east, and again, if we scroll back up and look at why that makes sense, well, the momentum of the first one of car A was much smaller. It was a lower mass and a slower speed, but B is now traveling faster, and it has a bigger mass, so it has more momentum. So it's almost like it wins in this collision. Overall, these cars are moving west because um, west, or the, the car B had more momentum going west than car A had going east. Okay, so there's two uh, kind of numerical examples for you. Um, and one of the things we can look at is where do these sort of, uh, where, where is this momentum conservation idea really important? Um, oh, and I missed one that we just actually did. Uh, collisions, and we'll do more of this idea next time. Um, but so, some examples of, of where we're going to see this. So one of the, the, the best examples is going to be rockets. So uh, hopefully you know that uh, in space there's nothing to really push against. So airplanes don't work, cars don't work, because both of those rely on Newton's third law in terms of pushing against something. But with momentum conservation and rockets, rockets bring their own fuel. So if you imagine there's a rocket with a little bit of fuel, and what rockets do kind of like our guy sitting on the ice, is they throw that piece of rocket fuel at the back via an explosion or a combustion, and then that's going to cause the rocket to go in this direction with a slightly less velocity because the masses are different. But if it throws out enough of them at enough of a speed, it's going to end up being able to lift off and move around in space. Um, squids do similar things, uh, except they're going to be having, uh, they're ejecting water instead of having to eject particles on their own. Um, explosions are kind of uh, interesting to examine physically, so if we imagine here's a bomb, or a, a grenade or something, and when it explodes we're going to have this fracture into two pieces, so each piece is going to of course go flying off in different directions, and hopefully you can see now that it's got to be exactly opposite directions if there's only two pieces, and if we know where one is going we can actually figure out where the other one's going just based on momentum conservation, and again we'll do some more of this uh, in class. And then explosion, or sorry, collisions because we just did an example like that. So we'll do some more complicated problems with uh, this momentum conservation idea in class uh, next time. And uh, our further, our next topic is going to be looking at collisions in a little more detail uh, and different kinds of collisions.